Welcome to another figure week, park surface week, organic week. Hey everyone, my name is Ahmed Alduri. I'm a concept artist and former instructor at Art Center College of Design, Brainstorm, CCS, CJMA, and various other places. And I would like to introduce to you this digital painting course that I've created. But before we get into anything, I just wanna thank you for the support you've all given me this whole time. And with the support of so many of you, I've been able to put together everything I know about painting into this digital painting course. You want to become a pro, illustrator, concept artist, or even just a hobbyist, but you don't have a clear map to get there. And that's where I come in. I spent the last six months compiling everything I know from my 20 years of art practice, and I've turned it all into a map, starting with foundations such as rendering shapes, color theory, painting basic subjects, understanding brushwork, brush economy, all that fun stuff, deconstructing the skull, drawing it from every angle, Angle, all the way to master studies, stylized painting, and you'll find yourself at the end of the course doing a concept art project based on everything that we learn in the first 14 lessons. So how does it work? Well, you sign up, you watch the lectures, do the assignments, post them to the community page if you want, and treat it as a self-study, except for those of you who have signed up for the weekly meeting where I personally critique your work in a virtual classroom setting. I believe learning by repetition is super important. That's what I've sort of presented a lot in this course, and the assignments are tailored for that, as adapted from my time teaching at Art Center. And each of these lessons have step-by-step -step explanations in real time. If you've ever seen my videos, you know exactly how I teach. And this course is intended to be a substitute for a college level course, but you don't have to pay the four or $5,000 per class, racking up maybe 200K in debt. With my custom design course, you'd be paying a fraction of that. And of course, I also have payment plan options if you don't want to pay for the whole thing at once. Thank you for watching this and I'll see you soon. Hey guys, and welcome back to Digital Artcast. Um, here back again with another great episode, uh, talking to lovely people from around the world, um, and hoping that you guys are again um, enjoying your time indoors. Um, I know that it seems like this uh, pandemic has gone on forever, but hopefully, please God, it will end soon and uh, life will return to normal. Uh, another great episode, um, focusing again on uh, games production and 3D. Um, as we've been doing for the last couple of episodes. Um, trying to break up between illustration, audio, uh, different disciplines, but yeah, three of these, one of these ones that are near and dear to my heart. So it's always great when I get to talk to someone who is within the same field, the same industry, um, has the same kind of interest. So uh, yeah, a great one for you today. Um, this person that I have on today is a, someone that I've, I've wanted on for a long time. But uh, again, as, as with these uh, podcast setups, um, trying to nail people down with schedules can be difficult. Um, especially with uh, some companies that they may work for, um, just finding time in between projects, it, it, it can be a challenge. So luckily today we have uh, an amazing guest on um, and I'll let them introduce themselves. But today, can you please welcome along uh, Mary Sue Challoner. Hey Mary, how are you doing? And oh God, I cannot unmute you. Why is that? There is a 
can you unmute yourself, Mary? Can you do that? Can you click the little, the little mute oh, button? Oh, yeah, there sorry. You. Uh, there you go. Hey. <laughs> yeah. off, the, off to a great start, aren't we? Yes. Fantastic. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Fucked um, it up already. <laughs> no, that was way too nice of an intro, though, when realistically I'm just a, a bit of a pain in the ass, but yeah. <laughs> oh, no, you're all good. See, this is the thing. We're talking uh, before we started recording, guys, and Mary was like, why have you got me on? What are we going to talk about? But you're... <laughs> You're a legend, Mary. You're 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 good people. Yeah, you have uh, you have some nice uh, 3D uh, chops behind you and some great games you've worked on. So yeah, there's there's plenty to talk about. Um, so yeah, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, for people who don't know you, um, can you give yourself a little introduction of who you are and where you work? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, well, my title is environment artist, but I work for the props team. Uh, Ubisoft Reflections in Newcastle. Um, previously from Coatsync, did some stuff for Decagon, and my first job was at Sumo Digital in Sheffield. Cool, awesome. And that's, I mean, for even people I know, that's that's a big resume. Um, like you know, you've you've definitely hit some of the major milestones um, in maybe specifically the three D field, but especially the UK three D field, right? I mean, Sumo and themselves are a big team. Um, even though they might not seem like they're they're um, you know massive in size and scale, but some of the projects I've worked on are, are crazy big, and uh, you know Coat Sync also great studio, um, and of course Decagon. I mean, if if people are in the CG world or even in the 3D world, um, you know they will know who Decagon are. Um, Clinton, shout out! Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm hoping to have one soon as well. By the way, Clinton's Clinton's lining up for for an episode at one point, so yeah, hopefully that will happen soon. Um, but then I think the, the the most popular one I saw eight, way back was the like the fridge you done the mini cooling fridge. Oh right, yeah, the de- the Decagon one. Yeah, that yeah. was that was a cool one. Yeah, I mean, like you've done a fair few projects and a fair few different companies. And again, was was it something that you studied way back in the day? Did you go to school for this or? So it's kind of like a weird and really long winded story, actually. Um, Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> great. So, right, I'll go right from the beginning then. So, I was born yep. in uh, 1990. No. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, uh, I originally wanted to be like an English teacher. Okay. Um, so, I started to like go to college and do all like uh, English literature and stuff. Right. But then I was just like, oh, this is so boring. I can't do this. Um, but that's <laughs> all I've ever known as well. Because, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, when you're at school, you're just surrounded by teachers and you're like, oh, yeah, that's probably, I'll, I'll just do that. But um, <laughs> I was always playing games. Mm-hmm. And then, like, it must have been like all the stars align and then something happened. But it was so weird. You know, like, sometimes when you have these really off days and you're just bored and you don't know what to do so you end up checking your spam emails okay <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I went into my spam emails mm-hmm. like once i probably do this like twice a year right and then i got an email from this company called um train to game which i realize now is probably like a a weird scam or something looking back yeah I finish it but i got approached with him way back in the day when i first left my job um and i think i'd put something on social media or some kind of mailing list for 2d art they also got in touch with me but then yeah, yeah. i did re- realize pretty quick yeah they were kind of like a scam yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's sad <laughs> really but um yeah yeah in one sense though it was um a blessing in disguise because despite my parents paying thousands of pounds for this course it helped me right. get on track to where i want to go uh, right. made me realize that you can do it as a career and stuff right so from there i switched college and then basically i uh, did a uh, media games and animation right. at rotherham college in, Sh- in sheffield right. and then i went to um university in sheffield and then from there i just got my first job at sumo and then the rest is history really i mean you're definitely glossing over. I mean, you said long, you said long winded and weird. But <laughs> <laughs> I tried to keep it short. <laughs> You've only talked for like a minute, but <laughs> but no. I mean, like, so I mean, breaking in the industry is you and I both know is no an easy thing, right? It, some yeah. people. I mean, I know me personally. I've worked for years towards getting where I am, right? Even at this point, but for you, Susumo so was the first kind of stop. But where was the the juncture between? leaving school and getting into sumo like were you applying there were they headhunting how did that come about 
So, um, towards the end of the course, that's kind mm-hmm. of when I realized I wanted to do environments. Mm-hmm. And I did like, I've actually hidden it on my portfolio because it's very <laughs> cringy, but uh, I did like a, um, a remake environment for uh, Elder Scrolls Morrowind. Right. Um, and that was quite well received when I was uh, applying for companies. Right. Uh, but I got my foot into Sumo specifically because they were advertising through our course like a voluntary role for gameplay balancers. Right, and I'd okay. already done this years prior on a Sonic game. Right. And then they were doing it for Crackdown 3. Is it Crackdown okay. 3? Or Crackdown? Yeah, Crackdown 3. Mm-hmm. Um, so I applied for that. Mm-hmm. I got in and then I did like a two weeks gameplay balance in, in the team. And I applied for QA because they right. had an opening. And then at the same time, I was approached by Playground um, and I got an offer from Coatsync as well. Right. And then Sumo called me up and was like, oh, you've applied for QA, but we've seen your portfolio. Are you sure you don't want to do environment instead? But at this <laughs> point, they didn't actually have it like on the website. And I was like, right. oh, hell yeah, because I've always wanted to work there. Right. And then, uh, yeah, I, I just... I don't know that, how I, I got it, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you were you're obviously were doing something right, and I mean, I think people don't want to look back on their older stuff yeah. too much, right? Because it, it seems like it's cringy. But then at the time, it was probably something you were pretty proud of. Like you probably finished that and looked at it and went, "That's pretty good." Like that's you know that's something you know maybe know the best thing in the industry. But like for me, that was like you know a milestone. That was something like I worked really hard on, and it's it's turned out to be really good. So and obviously at the time, you know, it also was great because you got a job offer from it. You know, from several yeah, places. Yeah. You're telling me. So I mean, I think it's 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 uh it's very common in this industry. You can quite everybody can be quite self deprecating. You know, you can say it yourself like ah, you know, my work's crap and blah, blah, blah. But then I I think I look back at the things I was first doing in 3D, and it's the same thing, right? You think to yourself, it was crap. But then at the time, you were learning. And then you look at where you're now, and you think, how did I get this far? But you just keep on keeping on, basically. That's that's kind of the thing, isn't it? You just keep going forward in one direction, and eventually you get somewhere. But, I mean, Sumo, especially, what, how old were you when you got hired by Sumo? Um, I must have been 21, 22. Wait, how old am I now? 20... <laughs> It's gone in. so fast, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Uh, uh, yeah, it must have been. I've been in industry like five or six years. So it must right. have been 21, 22, yeah. Right. I, and again, I think for, you know, entering a professional industry at that age is still a great achievement. Like, you know, me sitting here in my 30s, you know. But obviously I, I worked as an engineer beforehand. But still, you know, I, f- I feel like there's such an intake of younger generations in the, in the game industry and it really is crazy how, like most studios, you'll know yourself where you work. There is probably a, a scattering of, of age groups, but yeah, it seems to be that people in their early 20s are just like diving into these roles now. And oh, yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think we're I lucky mean, though because we've got more like course offerings and we, we get more guidance Whereas, right. like, years and years ago, it's, like, it seems harder. Like, a lot of people I used to work with at Sumo are, like, well, some are, like, near on retiring, and they've come back from, like, graphic backgrounds and stuff. Right. So, so then they go to school specifically for game stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, No, it's quite common as well. I think even we were talking about this the other day where um, when I first left my job in 2012, like, you know, Art station wasn't even a thing yet, right? It wasn't even a blip in anybody's eyes. It was it was non-existent, and you know, online learning, especially. I mean, Nomon was pretty much one of the only, you know, apart from maybe like some online forums that were doing professional teaching. And now, I mean, like YouTube is littered with learning. Like, there's just so much free stuff yeah. out there, including all the things that Art Station now, because also Epic just bought them. Like a lot of their Art Station learning resources are all free. So I mean, it's just there's almost no excuse to learn, right? I mean, like, no, sorry, no excuse not to learn because yeah. there's so much stuff just sitting out there ready to be used. Um, and then if, I mean, like, I've just found this and I've only been in the industry or been working for money, like been working professionally for a month. But even I can see the benefit 
of working in the team I'm working with with people who are more experienced than me, right? Like you learn exponentially quicker. Oh when yeah, you yeah. Are thrown in an environment where people are, you know, feeding back to you, letting you know how your stuff looks, giving you critiques. So what was the first like year or two years of sumo like? Like was it super intense? Were you like swimming and then sinking or sinking and swimming like i mean especially for the stuff you worked on right because the first ship project you done was was it hitman or was it crackdown yeah, hitman. right yeah right so did you feel like it was a lot at the time you went into the role did you feel quite panicky or did you handle it quite well like how was it well um oh, it was uh it was pretty insane actually i remember like for the first few weeks i didn't like it didn't sink in where I was, if you get what I mean. Like, I was sat at my desk like, what am I doing? What is this? This is a game. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the first month of working at Sumo, alongside all these professionals, like, right. yeah. I sat next to somebody who worked on, like, GTA Five and GTA, right. like, Vice yeah. City and stuff. Wow. And I learned more in that first month than I ever did four years at uni. Like, for sure. Right, Completely yeah. different. Yeah. It's just such a different experience when you're actually in it. And I feel like, you know, once you're in it, you're in it. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think getting your foot in the door is the hardest bit, right? But then yeah. once you're in, then, like I say, it just it goes on exponentially. Like, you just get offered more and more opportunities. There's more and more doors open. More and more people see your work or you get more and more experience. So you're getting trusted with stuff like, you know, you go for junior to mid, you go for mid to lead. Like, you know, you can take up these positions super quick if you're dedicated enough um in what you're doing um but then you were there you were at sumo for quite a bit like so what like two two three years something like that for uh, sumo? i think it's like 18 months something okay. like that yeah Year and a half. right okay yeah so, so what was the jump from sumo to coat sink and why was that a thing you went to um that was more like for personal reasons. So I was, right. uh, so I, I'm originally from Sheffield. Uh, right. It made sense for me to work in Sheffield. I loved the people. I loved the job. I like right. always referred to it as the Disneyland of the industry because of how nice it is to work there. Right. Um, so the only reason I went to Coatsink was to be closer to my partner because uh, I was commuting six hours a day total. So I was getting like four trains a day. Jesus. Um, and it was insane. Yeah, but it's like in my eyes, it was worth the commute because it was that, right, of course. that yeah. nicer place. But to still, work. I mean, wow. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. It's, it's intense. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I think that's one of these things that people never think about because we get so many people talking about, like, oh, I just moved here and moved here because this opportunity, because they were hmm. giving me more money or this project was even more amazing. But then you were like, oh, no, but my partner was there and I wanted to be close to family and friends. And yeah, it's, it's something I think is lost in the industry. I think it's something that, you know, like people don't really talk about often is like the human element of. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, especially because you have you have a kid as well. Right. So, yeah balancing that and work of course is something that I could even fathom because it's I find it hard enough just to try and focus on your work never mind yeah looking after Sunday yeah. I mean so yes yeah, it's, it's a lot to take in I mean have you found has it been difficult like having a little one plus like working full-time and stuff that it's that just been a balancing act oh the, my gosh just, yeah. yeah no it's been <laughs> so difficult especially like since I've not been in school because he's only seven so right he needs a lot of attention, <laughs> even if it's just talking about Godzilla for like four hours. He needs he needs attention, especially because he's you know by himself. He doesn't have any siblings. Of course, right. But uh, I'm actually really lucky because um, a lot of people that I know in industry that have kids have really really struggled. But uh, right. Ubisoft have been like amazing with people with yeah. kids. Like that's good. I've been able, like, if I can't go to a meeting, I can just be like, oh, I'm sorry, guys, I need to make Leonard's food or something. And right. they've been so good with it. And honestly, I, could, mm -hmm. I don't think I would have been, I don't think I'd have done it anywhere else. So Right, yeah, because just to support their, I mean, that is a yeah. good thing, like, to be shouting from the rooftops, because I think people have these horror stories sometimes about, you know, people working in the industry and 
how tough it is to balance stuff and you know a lot of co- companies are not family friendly and then they really you know support you with if you have kids if you have a partner like loads of things like that so yeah thank god for that right i mean yeah at oh, least there's know, some, yeah. yeah so you moved up to to coat sink and you were doing um I mean, it says officially on your 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 art station, which I think is almost like art assign DV. Um, <laughs> was 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 Transformers, right? Um, yeah. So, how did Decagon come into the mix? Was that something you were doing outside of Coat Sync as well? Were you doing that on top, like freelance outside of full time in Coat Sync? Yeah, so I was doing full time Coat Sync. You know, mm-hmm. same company as my partner, which was awesome. Um, right. Uh, on the stylized Transformers game. Mm-hmm. But I've always considered myself, you know, like I've loved photorealistic f- uh, props. I just feel like they're, they're more difficult in some senses. Um, I just, so Enjoy I was just like trying yeah. to do a bit more on my spare time. And I was like, oh, I, I want to get back into AAA. I w- that's right. where I am most comfortable after, you know, the experience with Sumo. Right. I like the organization and, and things like that and, and the stability and, and, and whatnot. Well, you know, right. you could go on about that for hours, but um Of course, yeah. So I was like, right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do an environment. So I was I picked out like this post apocalyptic thing. Right. And the first asset that I picked off it was uh the oven. But then by right. the time I'd finished the oven, I was like, Yeah, I don't wanna do this environment anymore. <laughs> So I just put that on my portfolio. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I, I think I messaged Clinton and I was like, it was either I messaged him or he messaged me. It was so long ago, I cannot remember. Right. Um, or I might have applied through email or something. Right. right I think it okay. might have been there. Yeah. And I was right, like, oh, right. I've always wanted to do Decagon stuff because at uni they were like rock stars to our right. course. Right. So I was like, oh, I'm just going to do it. Nothing's going to happen, but I'm going to do it anyway. Sent it <laughs> off. And Clinton was like, oh, yeah, this is this is great. Let's uh, let's do some stuff. So I joined the collab stuff to do, you know, when they do the asset packs. Yeah, yeah. So I started off doing some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was invited to do some contract stuff. And that was so amazing, so fun. And I think that's what basically led me to get my job at Ubisoft. Uh, that experience there so yeah I was really lucky yeah. there I mean I, I mean it's funny how for the career you've had right and the things you've worked on your portfolio seems smaller but not in a bad way right I think it's, yeah. the, it's the exact thing people talk about where I mean Jeremy just talked about this in Dynasty not too long ago at Decon he was like I'd rather see a portfolio with six pieces that are well done than 60 pieces that are half-assed you know what I mean like yeah every and I can see why, I mean, like, you know, the reason I saw that, you know, the the oven was going about for a while, right? And I definitely was commenting on your posts and, and talking to you about it back and forth, like when you were posting it. And I can see why Clinton liked it. You know, like, it, it's one of the things that you can see in Decagon where, you know, the attention to detail, like it is just over, like over the top. Like there's just so much nuances and little bits and, like even the fact that on the front, like you know, the the symbols for the, the the clickers are all like you know they're there, but then they're quite they're kind of rubbed off, like they have been worn and yeah, but just the right amount. Like it doesn't look like it's been erased. It kind of looks like it has been faded over time or been cleaned and it's been rubbed away. Like all that stuff is it, when you look at anything Decagon, is that right? Every single prop they make is just nuanced to hell. Like there's yeah. just so many things. I mean, you know this, right? You work with Hannah, like, and you've seen. Her work also, like the stuff she yeah. does, like it's the same kind of vibe where you know you just like pour your heart into a prop, basically. And yeah, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm definitely feeling that now. Like I'm doing like this whole scene right now, and and I'm modeling stuff, and it's like it's a, a warehouse that has like you know multiple things lying about it. And I got to the end of like one of the generators I was building, and I was like. <laughs> I'm so fucking done. <laughs> like I just oh like, the thing okay. that you posted on Facebook. I think I've seen yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The generator, like, like <laughs> building building that gen, like, has I'm no joke. Took me something like a week solid worth of work, and I mean, I'm trying to obviously new after work, but like once I finished that generator, I was really just like, I could just post this. I could just be done. I could bake this down and texture it and just be finished. Um, but I, I don't know. There's something in me. I'm kind of like, I should just keep going. I should just keep. 
just keep going just finish the scene like once it's finished it'll mm. be done but it's, it's so much work you know and i mean i've always seen the funny thing when people talk about the distinction between props and environment artists but like i think props and environment have with the you know yourself they have so much in common because an environment is just a scene made up of props right so yeah um but like the, the classroom especially that you worked on me back like i mean that was you know, again just oozing with just personality and every prop was just it felt lived in and everything felt touched in some way like um i mean how do you tackle something on that scale i mean like is it just that you're kind of just by the numbers breaking it down per person doing so many props and are you working like small collective teams or like i mean obviously without getting too much into decagon's internal process that you can't talk about but like when you're approaching those kind of like pro, pro, uh, packs like the, the classroom like how do you start something like that well that was done like by a, a large team of us um right but the the consistency of quality in in the props is a lot down to like the amazing leadership they've got there like they, they go through every single prop give personalized feedback to everybody mm-hmm. and so that they, they get to the same quality in the end Right. Um, but I wasn't actually involved in the environment creation there. I just did a couple of small props near the end of uh, the project. Right. But um, something that's quite ironic, actually, you know how you mentioned your generator thing? Right. Uh, that was the next prop on my environment list, and I started the generator, and that's what made me start <laughs> my uh, environment I've still got the model and it's like when I saw yours on Facebook it made me feel a little bit physically sick because I was like thinking of mine oh I hate you know like the reference gathering for those things oh, oh my god it's just when like I, start, I started to it, it was it was fucking annoying me is what it was because every time I finished a wee piece and I kept turning the reference I was like Jesus Christ there's more there's like oh, there's yeah. so many internal like there's a whole combustion engine and an exhaust and all these wires for the fuel I was like Jesus and then like just the front panel fixing the buttons and the turn oh, I was like, yeah. oh yeah. my god this is taking forever <laughs> whereas like I actually went away you know what helped me I just went away for it and modelled a set of ladders because like yeah. <laughs> it was something just simple I could just fire it out I even made a bin at one point I was like Oh, thank God, it's done. Like it's 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 a yeah. bin that's finished. It looks alright. Like, but then even the bin, because, like you know, when you start getting to a level where you build things, right, and you start to feel a bit professional about your work, you try to nuance every minutia of your model, and even making the wheels for the bin. I'm no joking, you. Like I was like <laughs> like moving verts at one point, like just like inch by inch and making sure they were all sitting in the wheel properly and yeah. oh, I just I was like oh I'll just stick the thing through it and maybe you'll notice I was like no I should really build like a hole for it to go through and something for it to sit in and then I built the bolts and then I built the wee bearings and I was like oh god I really need it. and then by the end of it, I'd, I'd spent like an hour on a wheel I was like oh my god like just <laughs> yeah it eats away at your life it really does but oh yeah it does yeah it's like an obsessive compulsive thing I just I think when I just get started on something I just I can't stop myself. I just can't like pull myself away for for finishing it. And that generator was like, oh god, it was a. I mean, like a labour of love. Like I did enjoy it in the end, but like I think I got to a point where I just was, it was done. Like it was enough. Like uh, there was enough pieces inside it. I was like, Navy's going to look that close. Like it's going to sit in a scene. It's done enough. Like <laughs> didn't yeah, add yeah, definitely. Anything else? Like at this point, it's something like thirty six thousand tries for the high poly. I was like. There's nothing else needs to go in that. It's done. It's finished. So, yeah, um, it's hard to like figure out when to stop, especially if it's in an environment. Because I feel like you know when you're making props, and if you're just a prop artist, it's mm-hmm. easy to be like, "Oh, this has got to be the sexiest prop alive. It's got to look amazing." Yeah. But realistically, it's just gonna go like in some tall grass or something <laughs> stupid, and you're never gonna see all this detail. <laughs> and then when you get feedback uh, too, it's like, oh yeah, no, there's too much on it. You gotta take it back, take it back, make it more simple, because <laughs> it's not a hero prop. It's so hard. <laughs> like I can't win. I just can't win. Like I either do nothing or too much. Like there's yeah. no in between. <laughs> like fuck. Um, I mean, like it, it was the same. Probably like you'll find now. I mean. <sighs> You you done some obviously last minute stuff on the classroom, but then was the fridge because obviously for decade ago I'm used to seeing uh, scenes rather than just sometimes individual props. So yeah. we're like the the fridge and of course your latest one was the the throne. Were these things that 
were in packs or, or you were doing as a collective? Or was this stuff that you were getting just individual assignments or? Uh, so it was like, you know, the collab, the collab uh, packs, the asset packs. You, right. you got to pick which ones mm-hmm. that you uh, wanted to do. Right. So those were two of them I picked. I picked the cooler actually as my first one because I thought, oh, you know, it's small enough. I can you know get my hands stuck in, learn the process, give me a good opportunity to learn how they give feedback and whatnot. Right. Um, and then I did the the throne, which was a similar thing. I thought, oh, it's got a little bit of cloth on it. I want to try something something there, learn something there. Some cloth, some stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah. most of the stuff actually that I did there, um, I, I haven't got on my portfolio. I don't think I, I'm all right to do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but then it's one of these things as well. You know yourself, like you worry about putting stuff in your portfolio constantly, but then you get to a level where like you don't really need stuff in your portfolio like your your namesake is good enough that you know people know how good your stuff is they didn't really need to see tons of it if there's one or two good pieces on there then that's enough and I mean the fridge itself the cooler is like you know again it's and no in a bad way but simple enough but then like it's so well done you know like it doesn't have to be like an engine you know like we talked about the generators right I mean like yeah People look at those things like it's 3D porn, right? Like, oh my God, you know, like <laughs> yeah. there's so many valves and screws and if I, if I model this and there's so many, wee, like I, there's a lot of things in it, but it doesn't mean that it's going to maybe look any better than the cooler, right? Like it's just that yeah. there's more things in it. It doesn't mean that it's it's, it's, a, it's a better prop. And yeah. the thing again, I think even where the difference between I've seen in, in junior 3D modelers and people who are obviously more advanced, I think is the texture and lighting work right you can model yeah. to an extent but then when you take your texture and lighten to the next step then that's when your stuff starts to really like look amazing that it can sit in a, a world that it feels like it's part of the world um it's was there a point you felt like maybe even before you went to ubisoft or when you got to ubisoft that you felt like you had leveled up did you feel that there was certain things you were doing like even in your personal stuff or stuff you were doing when you were open, you know, your 3D package that you felt it had changed? Because I'm, I mean, it's a weird question to ask and I don't know if I could even answer it myself, but I know there's certain points I've got to where I've modeled stuff and I thought to myself, that's better than what I can usually do. Yeah. I think I went forward a wee bit, what's happened here? But was there a point, do you think, before you went to, did you feel ready for Ubisoft? Did you feel like you were kind of hitting the ground running there? Um, It's, it's kind of weird, actually. Like, I always... I think it's just an artist trope, isn't it? Like you, you hate your own work, and I yeah, did yeah. for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it, it it just sort of happened overnight, and it was really strange. Mm-hmm. I think it was mostly down to starting to use Substance Painter because mm-hmm. uh, when I was in Sumo, we didn't use Substance Painter. We basically textured in Photoshop and stuff. And right. then uh, when I got to um, Coat Sync. Uh, Hannah was my lead at that point and she was uh, wanting us to learn Substance Painter for the project and right. honestly to be honest in many ways I probably owe my, my career to Hannah for <laughs> making me learn Substance Painter right. um, and then from that I just kind of went overnight from like the crap that I am on my portfolio to the oven the next week after learning Substance Painter right um because I found it like way more fun and it kind of just like once you start having fun with it that's when it gets better like for sure yeah Yeah. I can definitely attest to that like I know myself the fact that because for me like mere personal reasons but for me initially the biggest concern I had the last couple of years was money right because I was yeah working from like freelance gig to freelance gig I was getting like a wee bit of work here but then for a couple of months nothing so it just was like a constant stress. And when I opened Maya or any program, I was like, oh, you know what I mean? Like it just sapped the energy at me because I just didn't enjoy it anymore. Um, and then as soon as I know, like, oh, I've got a paycheck coming this month and it's going to arrive here like every month. Like, you know, yeah. there's definitely a weight was lifted off my chest. Like I can just open Maya and model stuff and there's no judgment. There's no like, oh, this has to be good because I want to, get, you know, I need to get a job. It was just like, oh no, I'll have a job so I can do this for fun. You know, like, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, I mean, is that something that, I mean, you've obviously experienced that for a while now, right? You've been working in the industry five years, but um, do you still feel like the fun is in it for you? Do you still feel like you're enjoying 
the process and and I mean, are you doing 3d still like at night or when you have time or is it mostly kind of all just within your work right now oh my god hell yeah it's still fun um, yeah oh, that's good <laughs> actually um when i was at uni I, I can see what you mean now you've just mentioned that like just thinking when i was at mm. uni and i didn't have a job i was so stressed and i like i got really depressed and i found yep. it really really hard to to do any work yep I absolutely hated 3D at that point, and I was really considering not doing it anymore. Yeah, um, same. But then when I went into sumo, mm-hmm. and I, you know, I was, I had, I did it nine to five. It was scheduled. Mm. Yep. Like, like I had to do it. Um, yeah, yeah. And once I sort of overcome like the initial leftover depression from uh, uni School. and all the stress yeah. and everything. I started to enjoy it more and then I loved mm. it and then I got better and better and better. Um, so yeah, I can yeah. see what you mean, but as for like stuff outside now, um, I did do stuff like when I was at coat sync mm-hmm. and I did start to do a bit of sumo, uh, mm-hmm. when I had the chance, obviously because of like traveling and, and my son and stuff. Of course. But, um, I think, uh, my perspective, throughout covid has changed a lot i've right. dropped all my freelance work uh, this is actually this uh this talk now is the first thing 3d wise i've done out of work since starting ubisoft right um and i've just been so much happier and i've loved my job and my yeah. work's so much better um so i mean that's, <laughs> everybody's that's, different I, yeah i mean no, like but that's positive at least because i mean i think I mean, definitely one of my fears was, and I think that fear was founded in a, a weird way that I'll, I'll talk about quickly, where when I'd done my uni time, you know, I was lucky enough that I pushed it enough, you know, I was I was out seeking because the, the so the university where I went in Paisley, they had, or had had in the past a working relationship with Access Studios in Glasgow. Um, you know Access, right? Access Studios, yeah. So they done internships at one point where people would come up from the university and they would do some time in the studio and then go back and get experience. Yeah. And at the time when I was there, they kind of lost that. But then when I went down to industry workshops in 2016, they were at a table and I kind of introduced myself, say, I'm, I'm from there, I'm from Scotland. And uh, I'd love to check access out. I've heard a lot about you guys. And because uh, I think at the time you had just done one of the cinematics for Halo 5. So it was like, oh, well, that's going to be pretty amazing or it's yeah. going to be really epic. So, um, And I think that experience kind of put me off when I was there because it was so intense. I mean, not the work that I was doing, but I think the people who were working there were so intense, right? It was, you know, yeah. th- there's such a big studio in regards to, like, the projects they handle. Because when I was there, they were working on, like, League of Legends. They were doing the cinematics for Destiny 2. Like there was a lot of big, huge things going on. And I felt just like a small fish in a massive lake. Like it was just overwhelming for me. And that yeah. my first experience was what I think was bad because now that I'm working for what could be conceivably perceived as an indie studio, I feel a bit more relaxed. Like yeah. the work the work is still plentiful and there's enough stuff to do, but I didn't feel that huge overwhelming pressure. Like if your first job was like, well, your first job was sumo. I mean, that's massive in itself, right? But like, I don't know if there's a massive distance between Sumo and Ubisoft because they're, they're pretty much both AAA studios, but, like, I don't know if, like, that's the best thing to always aim for is to be in Because, like, when I went to do a talk weeks ago eh, online to some eh, kids who work or who are in Mold University and they were like, oh, you know, I'd really love to work for Blizzard. I'd love my first job to be for, like, Rocksteady. And I'm like, well, that's great aspirations, but, like, they're huge studios to go into yeah. for, like, straight to university. That's, like, a big ask for anybody pressure-wise and expectations. And, I mean, have you ever kind of felt that? Like, have you ever felt like that? Like, have you I'm, – what I'm trying to get to you is, have you ever felt that pressure since Sumo? Or have you just kind of went in a roll each time just kind of, you know – uh, moving with the tide do you feel like it's, it's been quite a smooth transition like when you first started the coat sync when you first took your first project on the decagon when you started your first week in like ubisoft has it all just kind of been like has sumo been the only time you felt really like pressure um i suppose it it i don't know it, it kind of depends on the company too like which you go in like right. my 
my experience of the smaller company was probably not as good as your experience uh, at your right. company. Right. Um, but Sumo felt more like a smaller company too, because at that time they only had Sheffield and Nottingham Studios. They didn't have like all the Newcastle, uh, Leeds, and everything. Right. It, it was just a little bit smaller than it is now. I mean, it's bloody massive now, but um, <laughs> yeah. I suppose I mean, yeah. so that like the pressure, um, mostly for me was Ubisoft because right. that's where I've always wanted to work. Uh, I applied when I was at uni to do Mm -hmm. an internship and then I applied another four times throughout my career and then fifth time lucky. (laughs) (laughs) But then again, it's like, I think at that point when you'd walked into, I mean, it's probably a blessing in disguise, right? Where if you'd gotten the first time, like how different would that experience have been? Oh God, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like compared to when you had already had the experience of, sumo and coach sink and of course working in mm. gone like you know then you feel way more prepared for whatever they throw at you um because that's all experience is really right like you've been thrown enough problems and you've yeah, solved them enough yeah. times that you don't feel like you're going to run away with your like your head screaming like because you don't know what to do like you've kind of got a level head on you and i think when you want to something like ubisoft uh that's going to be a a, a benefit right yeah, I think it's like the best case scenario. Like as I've gotten older and a bit more mature and more experienced, mm-hmm. I definitely can see like I've come at the most perfect time. I've got experience from another AAA and a smaller company. You know, I've dipped my toes in every possible place, but I right. still want this. It's still the one that I want to go to. Yeah, but I've come in with enough confidence and and, and skills to be able to enjoy the job like I've always wanted to. But if yeah. I got in as an intern, it mm-hmm. would have probably ruined it for me in a sense because I'll probably be like panicking about, oh, what if they don't keep me on at the end? I've got to prove myself. I've got to learn this. I've got to learn that. Yeah. Whereas I've come in with skills and they trust me to do the job yeah. and they know that, you know, I'm going to be a good person to have on the team. I yeah. definitely think. Like, from my experience, I'm so glad mm-hmm. that I came in when I did rather than going straight into that one. So, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, I think somebody always talked to me about it where, because I think early on when I was listening to a lot of talks, people were saying the same word over and over again, and it was lucky. Like, oh, I'm lucky to be here. I was lucky to get this job. You know, oh, it was just, I was really lucky at the time. And somebody once said that he believes luck is preparedness meets opportunity, right? So... Mm. You've prepped yourself enough, you've got the skills, and then something comes along, bang, there you go. They two meet in the middle. That's the luck. That's what luck really means. So I've started using it in a different way where I'm like, well, I'm lucky to be here, but then it's not a negative of like, because people assume lucky means that you've you've done no work up until that point, right? You've just fell in it. You, you didn't do anything. But I like to view it as you've just had an opportunity because, you know, you've worked and worked and worked, and then something's just came along, you've grabbed it at the right time, and, and there you are. And yeah, I mean, it's interesting, I think, for where you're working now. Um, I mean, obviously, you can't talk about what you're working on, but, like, you know, it, it's a big studio, big IPs, big adventures, bigger-than-life stuff that they work on, and, and Ubisoft internationally, of course, is a massive, huge, ginormous, gigantic company. So yeah. fringe benefits for that stuff, you know, and they also have so many studios under under their uh, their uh, their wings you know like one of yeah. my favorite studios is is massive in in sweden right which are a huge studio and do amazing work with the division like that's such a great studio and you know it's one of these things where i'd love to work there one day but then i know you know i know the people who already work there right we know them yeah people like jeremy who are just legends in the industry and i didn't think i could sit next to somebody like jeremy <laughs> and feel <laughs> yeah. in, anywhere on par with like what he's doing like i, I would feel so lost um and uh yeah i mean i I think it's i mean i I don't know if you feel like there's certain skill gaps you have but like i know for me even though i'm quite comfortable in maya modeling like i still feel like my engine work is really really low like i didn't i'm just not familiar enough with unreal and my texturing as well even though i can use substance isn't it like you know the best stuff is is there anything you're kind of like learning right now given that you're also way more senior like is there anything that you're kind of diving into now that you feel like you're need to polish up on because at this point and with ubisoft right you probably have 
like a lot of foundations covered, like three D modeling, texture, and lighting, yeah. and your work. Is there anything that you're kind of working on just now, or? Well, I think, like, this is something as well that I've had to learn, like throughout working in the industry. Is mm-hmm. you're never gonna know everything because there's always gonna be something else that you need to learn or something news coming out. Like when photogrammetry got big, now you've got to learn this, you've got to learn that. Right. But uh, yeah, for me, like, well. So I, I kind of like started as a vegetation artist. Like that's mostly what I did on Hitman. Right. Okay. And then from there, I've actually been doing a lot of vegetation because that's what I know. Right. Um, and, and props now. So I'm really happy not to do as much vegetation. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I want to dabble in more like, um, I want to try my hand at like photogrammetry with ve- vegetation and like more like organic modeling like you know rocks and stuff because there's some amazing like artists on twitter that post these rock sculpts and i'm like oh my <laughs> god i want to do that it looks so amazing is it no but, crazy yeah. how you get excited over stuff like rocks <laughs> yeah i know right <laughs> you could be out on a walk with your family with your dog and be like mom hold on this rock is sick <laughs> i need to take a picture give me this yeah. <laughs> i remember uh, a couple of years back when I was, again, when I just left my job, one of my friends, because of where I am in Scotland, uh, he had a friend in Rockstar North. And he was like, if you want to meet up with him and ask a couple of questions, like you said, he would give up some time. And I was like, oh, that's really kind of him. And, and you know, and, and, and yeah. I met the guy and he talked about one holiday or not even just one particular holiday. He would talk about when he used to go on holiday and his wife would kind of get on him. But he, he took a camera <laughs> and he used to take pictures of like, everything like rocks trees you know like wood textures that he found or weird cool marble patterns and just she just couldn't move like or walk through places without him just like taking a million photos and it's like it's a weird obsession with artists especially with 3d because every time a new like substance comes out or something that gets really coolly designed in designer like you just you yeah. drool over it and you think to yourself, what has my life become? Like, I'm just <laughs> I'm getting excited about textures like what is happening to me? But eh uh, I think you just, I think we are, you just learn to have an appreciation for the world, right? You just... Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. Look at it with different eyes. Like, even, mm. like you said, walking the dog, like, just staring at the trees and seeing how the leaves move and, like, how the sky's sitting and what the light's happening. It, it's, it, it's it's crazy. It's, Sounds like never, this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. It's, 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 it's one of these things. I mean, this was back in 2016, and I met um, Yort, one of my buddies, who's a concept designer, and he was talking about because he was at Gorilla at the time, and they had classes on mindfulness. And I was like, the fuck is that? (laughs) Like, like, yoga? And he was like, no, no, man. Like, just, you know, like, being mindful of, like, you know, like, the ground and the pebbles and the rocks in between them. And I was like, this sounds like crazy talk. Like, you sound like, (laughs) you know, mental, like, what has gone on? But uh, but then it's weird years later, you start to say to yourself, all right, yeah, that's a thing. Like, people do now, like, it's... It's uh, especially when you start to work in bigger things like AAA because the way obviously console progressions are happening, like everything just needs to be so much more realistic and yeah, grittier and better textured and more polys and and even now like we I've seen some people like dabbling in um like the Unreal Five stuff, you know, like the high poly mesh stuff you can bring yeah. in, like, mm. full sculpts and stuff, and I'm like I can't, I mean, nobody can use it, obviously, it's just no ready for game production, but it's crazy to see the leaps that we're taking every time yeah. something else comes out. Mm. Have you, are you, I mean, particularly with Unreal, are you working in engine a lot? Like I said, in your personal work, do you find you're quite comfortable with Unreal now or is it still as foreign as it was way back when you started? Or, I mean, how is your relationship with engines? Or do you even use Unreal? Do you use Unity? Do you use something else? Or Well, for work, we use uh, the one we use at work, but uh, right, uh, <laughs> good <I> save. Have, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I've used Unreal a lot at uni, uh, right. and then we used it on a couple of projects at Sumo. So right. uh, I I know Unreal for environments and props, right? But the new stuff, not so much because. Uh, well, my kids spill orange juice in my computer, so since then... Oh, my God. <laughs> my, my PC's not being able to do... Like, I don't have, like, the best graphics card anymore. Like, so, Oh, no. But it is on my bucket list. 
Yeah, yeah, I could imagine. Like, yeah, the, like the. I mean, see, to be fair, now the problem I think even building PCs is just getting hold of components, right? Like it's. Oh yeah, especially now. Like, I had to buy my son's for Christmas. Right. From an eBay scalper, uh, and it was like seven hundred pounds for the thirty seventy, which is not seven hundred pounds. Jesus, but, uh, you know, as a wow. parent, you got to do what you got to do at Christmas. <laughs> yeah, I know it's it's definitely one of these things, but it's crazy even just now with the the three the three thousand series. Like, I mean, even the fact that thirty eighties are a bit more readily available, I didn't even want to get a thirty eight. I want a thirty ninety, yeah. but then I think the cheapest one I've come across to them is something in the region of three thousand dollars, and I'm just no paying that's that. Ridiculous, for the man. It is. I mean, yeah. it's actually cheaper to buy a brand new PC with a card in it. Yeah. Then get, then get the car. Like, it, it blows my mind how that is a thing, but like, it is. It's ridiculous. It is crazy. Especially for, I mean, some of the guys I know, like, who were building these crazy rigs for 3D render, and they were waiting something like, you know, 13, 14 months just for something to get done and built because it just was, you know, silicon is gone. It's, it yeah. just seems to just no be available anywhere. And, uh, you know, especially when I've got a job, I'm thinking to myself, I could get something pretty beefy. Like, I could really, you know, like, make something pretty spectacular if i save for a while and got something really good but then even try to get parts like even just looking the other night i was trying to put together like a dream build and just like pick stuff but every other thing i was picking was like a stock or six month wait limit or like pre-order you know send it to the email list will tell you when it's in stock i'm like oh, God, yeah right. no it's, it's i mean i could really go upstairs and use my son's pc his is way better than mine <laughs> He's got a curved monitor and everything, and I'm just sat down here with my four-year-old monitor. <laughs> it's the sacrifices you make for your kids, though. Oh, you yeah, just want, totally. want them to have something good. But, yeah, I was looking at the curved monitors as well recently. Like, Oh, yeah. I'm, uh, I've got three. I've got a 4K in the middle and two 1080Ps at the side, and one of them's vertical. But, like, I was saying, oh, I could just ditch away them, just get one ultra One big one, yeah. Yeah, people have talked about the the samsung odyssey the g9 oh one. my god yes <laughs> like, ridiculous yeah. for like a thousand pound and i'm saying it myself oh, is it really worth a thousand pounds but it doesn't really it look it? so nice <laughs> it does so like it looks yeah. incredible i mean it's 49 inches i'm I'm starting to say it myself like is that maybe a wee bit overkill but like oh, i don't know at this point it could be really i mean like i've seen some videos of people who have because uh oled tvs are really cheap now so people have been getting oh, yeah. the the 48 inch OLEDs, like the actual TVs, and just breaking their monitor into sections with some small apps that like put stuff in your windows. Yeah. But then I'm sitting like two feet away from my monitor right now. Like <laughs> the oh, TV's yeah, just going to like, like, kill my up. eyes. <laughs> yeah, I've got headaches. Yeah. Like, oh, ridiculous. I mean, the thing <sighs> with the curved ones, though, like uh, all the games that my son plays, like, I mean, he obviously plays like shitty roblox and stuff like all the crappy yeah, yeah. kitty games yeah, yeah. but uh like the stuff like when i've tried to play on it sometimes mm-hmm. like a lot of them it's like really hit and miss some will work some won't some will blue yeah. screen your pc yeah so for me i don't think a curved monitor yet is worth it i'm just gonna <laughs> stick with the two basic ones yeah side by side i mean it's the same with me right because i i jumped on the bandwagon a couple of years ago really early in 2017 when i got this computer and like the 4K monitors, crazy good. I mean, it's a, it's an Asus, uh, like a Pro Art series. So it's like they're super color corrected for like Ooh, yeah. photography and stuff. So like it looks really nice and it's 4K, but like it's only 60 hertz. So then I've got to my point when I'm playing some games, I'm like, God, like the frame rate's really chugging and it's really no keeping up. And even then I got like, I mean, I've got a 1080 Ti, which back then was a great card, but like some 4K stuff I, I play now, like I can't because it's the first world problems, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting here like, I can't give it 4K, this is so ridiculous. <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, but then like, yeah, I mean, but, but it's one of the, I think I almost envy some of the guys I know who do concept design because, I mean, a sketchbook for them sometimes is enough, right? But then yeah. for us to open like a couple of files in like Maya Blender or run like Substance at the same time, your computer starts to chug a bit, right? Especially when you're getting multiple monitors in the fray. So yeah. it just fe- feels a bit unfair sometimes. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't think I could ever run them at the same time, like, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lucky. I mean, I invested in 32 gig RAM at the time because I was like, at the time I knew I was running a couple of things at once. I was like, it's probably going to be pretty handy. So like it has saved me a couple of times, but uh, 
yeah, there's some like some like Yama Yurev's PC. I mean, when he was, I mean, I, I don't even know the specifics, but like it has 128 gig of RAM. I know that much, and like four graphics cards. So like, oh my God. God only knows what he's rendering out of that. <laughs> but like, yeah, that could run a small building. Like it's 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 crazy the amount of work some of these people put in these rigs that are just mind blowingly expensive. Um, but then it's like. I suppose it'd be funny just to go into some places like Ubisoft or Sumo and like see the computers they're running and like you're thinking to yourself, are they really that advanced? Are they really like, you know, like the cutting edge stuff that like is going to kill? I mean, like I know there were some places I've I've heard people have worked with like they're spending like five or six thousand pound per computer. Like oh on my each god, rig. yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? It's yeah, like but... it's weird though because you know when you're building them at home, like and you yeah. get these big ass sexy cases, you know million yeah. fucking lights all around it but then <laughs> you go into work and it's a little dinky shitty black box you know, how is that more powerful <laughs> like what is it then jesus but yeah. um, no i mean it's as big technology is, is a weird thing as well because people will, will spend so much on the fancy cases and the lights but then it's not yeah. actually adding anything like no <laughs> some of the some of the base card machines i've seen are like shoe boxes and like they run like these massive oh, big projects yeah. so yeah, yeah. so I guess when it comes to like the projects you're doing new and you're moving forward, what's the? It's like, I guess no specific to what your work, but like maybe just even personally, like what's the next milestone? Is there anything that you've got in the horizon that you think that's something I want to conquer, or that's something I want to look into, or like when I've got time, I want to try and sink it into that. You know, is it three D? Is it two D? Is it photography? Is it, I mean, like, I've definitely been, like, with Bedos, like, I've definitely been impressed with, like, all the photography stuff he's been doing recently. Like, there's just oh, so much. Oh, yeah, cool. like, a bunch of yeah. them have been, yeah. No, definitely, that's something um, I'm looking into. I'm saving for a camera now. Right. But, like I said, COVID has changed me a lot, like, right. on what I want to do. And I, yeah. I know that I don't want to always be sat in front of my monitor. I love it at Fair. work, but, you know, yeah. 12 hours a day for me with my kid yeah. and everything. It's, so I want to travel more. But I, right. I don't like not being creative at the same time. Um, of course. And going back to the conversation, you know, about taking pictures when you're out traveling. Yep. This is the advantage, like, because my girlfriend works in industry too. Right. So we both go and take a bajillion <laughs> pictures. So we're both I mean, saving up for these cameras. Right. Um, so we'll be able to travel more, mm -hmm. take some pictures. And I'd like to do some, like, like I said, some more photogrammetry stuff. Uh, with right. vegetation and and some some stuff like like that, so right. I think that's yeah. what's uh, on the cards for me next. I was supposed to go to New York in November, but right. I cancelled my bloody trip. And then a oh, week right. after, they said, "Oh yeah, you can travel back to America now." So oh, another time. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's still in the cards. I mean, we we definitely want to go to. Uh japan at one point like that's definitely on the bucket list and oh yeah imagine the pictures there oh yeah i mean like it would just be crazy but then it's like the money to get there the travel yeah the time of work like that's a big investment that's like and i know some people who worked you know four or five years in a project and then like took a month like just to go to japan because it was one place they could like decongest and just like be themselves and be quiet and no have like the hustle and bustle and i think i just like to want i'd want to go more now i'm a bit older i'd want to go somewhere like somewhere that's quiet somewhere that's a bit serene it's less city life it's less you know because i've done all of that for for most of my 20s like i went to places where it was like just like thriving and like the heart of london and stuff like that or, or across in america where there's like cities everywhere like oh, I, want to go somewhere yeah, yeah. Where I can just chill so um yeah i mean definitely like even i mean like i'd love to work in japan as well like that would be a dream as well and Anywhere in, in Asia, actually. I, I definitely have heard really good stories about some studios in, in both China and Japan and, and Malaysia. And uh, and then even then, like, I mean, the same way, like, America used to be a thing for me years and years ago. I used to just dream about working in somewhere like California, like Blizzard, of course. Like, everybody knows me, knows that. Like, I worked yeah. Blizzard for a long time. But with the recent stuff going on there and, and just California in general and America, like, I just, I'm you know, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm questioning everything. I'm like, do I really want yeah. to go there? Do I really want to live there? Like, that would it be that cool? Um, but it was funny because when I had Miche Kutiara on and I was talking about like, like at the time everything was going on with the States, he was like, yeah, because he's from Poland, right? So he was like, yeah, it's, it's no, you know, it's no Europe, but at the same time, it's no like CNN. It's no, <laughs> you know, you didn't walk out your door and there's like fire and death and guns everywhere. Like, it's just like, yeah. people think that because they watch the news, but in reality, it's, it's no really like that. So, um, yeah, that was on our like end 
end goal is it was America. Um, right. I like uh, the idea of going to, you know, like the Washington Wilderness near Seattle and stuff and uh, right. going all the way around there, Tennessee mm-hmm. and stuff. But uh, yeah. the scene like like San Diego and California yep. and, oh, man, it's so, so many, cool many good things. companies, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy when I got to go to Lightbox in 2019 and, like, got to tour Blizzard and Riot and meet my buddies there, meet Lydia, yeah. who's, new, who's new to Valve, you know, which is a crazy big jump as well and yeah just like some of the studios around there some of the people were just like super awesome and seemed like a really cool community but yeah yeah i think you just let so much of the the world news trickle into your head and you think to yourself oh it wouldn't be safe and it wouldn't be that great and you know health insurance like that's a whole thing over there (laughs) oh yeah yeah. (laughs) jesus christ and because you've got kids you're kind of like oh do they want to be doing gun drills and classrooms like is that something i want for my kids and it's, it's crazy when your priorities start to shift as you get a wee bit older yeah, definitely. It. Yeah, mm-hmm. so yeah, because so, for us, we've got to consider like all the the high school fees and that if we were to go over with Leonard and course. just too much. Yeah, I think if you go into a good studio, though, like if I know some of the bigger places, like if you go work there, like stuff like like help with like financial aid for like schools and like health insurance and stuff is already covered. Like, oh. that's so yeah, I mean. Like, if, Every company differs, right? But I know there's some bigger studios where, like, if you get hired as, like, a senior or you come across in a bigger role, like, you know, like, health insurance is provided. There's stuff that is part of your pay packet that you get, you know, money on top of, st- like, your pay to help with yeah. health insurance. and that. So, yeah, I think it would, it would it would be like anything, right? It'd have to be the right opportunity at the right time. It'd have to be yeah. something that was really, a ple- like, that really covered all the bases. You're like, your kids, your partner, you you know job security projects that were interesting like it would all have to kind of meet in the middle for something to be like i'm going to go move to whatever we couldn't yeah. maybe know america like anywhere in the world it'd have to be the right the right set of circumstances so who knows yeah. mary one day <laughs> maybe one day maybe uh, well yeah. maybe we'll uh be able to work from home forever sell all our shit get a van <laughs> <laughs> live in the woods oh god i kind of hate that sometimes though because i remember i was watching a tiktok once and somebody was like I'm here in my van and check the view. And then this guy interrupted <laughs> and he was like, can we just like stop glamorizing being homeless? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, it's I get it. Like, it's cool. But like, you've having to got a home. That's no as cool. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's a balance. Like, you know, maybe like downgrade to like a wee flat or something. But like, then he live out of a van. Come on. Like, <laughs> like, I know, but like, I'm renting now. Is it much yeah. different? <laughs> At least I would own the van, right? <laughs> I know, I know. I mean, like, I always thought it was, I mean, people talk about it on, on social media for so long that uh, for us, like, well, I see us as a millennial, like, I mean, I can still claim that because I was born in 1985, right? So I can still call myself <laughs> a millennial. But, um, ah, fuck it. But, uh, yeah, no, but, like, I always thought this whole thing, like, you'd never be able to afford your own home. Like, it's a, it's a pipe dream. It can never happen. And, uh, you know, Diane done it and less than two years like just absolutely scrimped and saved every penny she had um put everything away kept a hold of it got really good financial advice from uh, a first mortgage place that helped her out at kind of every stage um and the bank were pretty decent wear as well and she found a new build that she wanted and she just went and applied and, and got funding i mean like it, it sometimes can be just like if you really want something bad enough you will get it like you know yeah yeah and you have i mean I mean, like, no, obviously getting in the nitty gritty of your paycheck, but like, for where you work the new, you'll have a decent living compared to most people in the UK. So, I mean, you probably have a better stand on, you know, if you wanted to have a house, you know, it's it's probably more achievable for you than it has been previously. So, because I know oh, people, yeah, yeah. yeah, that are, are living on like less than minimum wage, like working at like supermarkets and Sainsbury's and Tesco's and stuff, and just like the thought of having to save any money for a long-term project is like it would never happen but uh, like we were discussing before the podcast like the money I've got now like it's you know I'm I'm very aware how fortunate I am to be where I'm right now and uh, but also aware how hard I worked for it I mean so like it's no came for nothing so yeah um, yeah yeah but yeah it's not it's it's not an impossible dream anymore I don't think no it's just scary but it's definitely doable that's what we're doing next that's how we're going yeah, the house the house dream's always the harder. I mean, it's been definitely the last month and a half, two months has been horrific, just organizing bills and moving stuff in, getting floors laid and stuff put in the garden and you know oh, fun stuff. 
Oh, I mean, all the adult stuff that you, you just loved in. You just, you know, a, I mean, there was points I was like going away for that stuff. I was like, I just want to sit down on my computer. I never thought I'd say this, but I just wanted to sit down on the computer because I'm, I'm sick of outside. But <laughs> it's like, but like, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of these things that I think it's, if you work hard enough and you get to a position where you're lucky enough to have certain opportunities, then like it's, it's getting... It's getting more doable than it has been in the past. And I think also because um, the way the markets are looking the new with house price inflations, like I think the market's on track to crash again. I think it's going to be another massive thing where it's going to fall through, um, yeah. which, will be, which will be great for first-time buyers, but shit for everybody else who owns a house. So, um, Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely a seller's market right now, but in a couple of years I can see it being like 2008 or again. The market's just going to, the arse is going to fall out and it's going to be, dead again so well um, fingers crossed <laughs> <laughs> that's all i can do is hope i've got my money i'm ready somebody this hunch stupid come on <laughs> i'm just I gonna bloody this. build it myself get a shipping yeah. container <laughs> i know well i or a van yeah and just or build a couple of vans on top of each other yeah, yeah. Shoots. <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. um well okay thank you very much for coming on and chatting mary yeah, thank you for having us here. Yeah. Exceptionally great. Um, yeah, I mean, like, we could do... I mean, something I've always wanted to do at one point, especially with 3D. I've done it a bit with 2D people, but is maybe get people on to look at people's portfolios that are submitted and maybe do a wee bit of critique or feedback and um, maybe give some areas to improve, stuff like that, or, or, like, even just further 3D talks or just hanging out and chilling. Because, I mean, I think what I've enjoyed about your talk today is the fact that... Um, you're not all industry. You're quite like you said, especially like you've you've kind of changed with COVID and, and life is now a priority versus work, right? So I think it's just fun when you get somebody on sometimes who can just talk normally. You know, they, they didn't have to be all industry or like, oh yeah, of course Unreal Engine and photogrammetry. You know, like they just go on and on and on. I mean, there's a time and place for that's great. I mean, sometimes I just learn so much by listening to people, but it's rare I can sit down and have just a conversation with somebody about life and the world. And I think with industry, especially we all get too caught up in the workaholic lifestyle and no thinking about our mental health and no thinking about taking time for our family or our, our, our body health, like our just general health, like it can get a wee bit scary sometimes. And I think it's good that we can sometimes just balance and have a fun yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah, it was so, nice. Yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you guys are still listening to this point, uh, thank you for, for checking out. Hopefully, you enjoyed uh stuff of what we had to say and and, and and got involved in the conversation if you want to check out any of mary's work um i will leave it all down below um and you guys can, can check it out on on the multiple socials i'll leave down uh, any questions or comments again leave in the youtube uh spot that we're in we're in uh spotify and google podcast itunes all those great things but uh we kind of live on youtube at the moment so if you want to leave any feedback or likes subscribe and leave some comments that will always help us out uh, and and that's pretty much it. Um, thanks again to you guys for listening. Thanks for Mary for coming on, and uh, we'll speak to you guys again. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>